this morning we uh, continue on Jonah, and I, uh, I titled this message A Second as a Chance. Just to recap on Jonah, what happened in uh, chapter 1 and uh, chapter 2, uh, so today we will go through uh, chapter 3 and 4 as one, and I'll explain why. But just to re, uh, recap, we are moving from the scene of the Great Sea, where uh, so Jonah fled on uh, so the, so the Great Sea, and the waves, there was just uh, so chaos, and then uh, so they, they had to throw Jonah overboard, and a great fish came uh, to his rescue that God sent, miraculously, out of love, out of his, his compassion, so to save Jonah. And we move from the great sea uh, so, uh, so to the great fish, now onto the, the great city, Nineveh. The emphasis is on the great, the great. It's interesting for, for me that God rules above everything that is mentioned as great. God rules over the sea because God could uh, send uh, Sakaos and seize it when uh, Sir Jonah was thrown over. Uh, so God ruled over the great fish and God relents on a great city. He is in uh, control over anything we can call great. If you have that great problem, well, God is greater than that. And just to, to remember that Jonah heard a word from uh, God and he ran away uh, so, uh, so 2,500 miles in the opposite direction, which in the, so, the day of uh, so, uh, so King Solomon, if you wanted to uh, so take a ship to uh, so Tarshish and uh, come back, you will only be back in three years. So Jonah really wanted to run away. He really did not want to take the word of God to Nineveh so that they can repent and God relent from the, so the so disaster. And we see Jonah was saved by the fish after he was uh, so, uh, so thrown overboard. He's a, a choice. Uh, so Jonah really wanted to, uh, so to die in this scenario. Uh, so, but he cried out and God sent a fish at his salvation. And last week I shared that even if you create that, that mess where you are in, God sends help. God comes and he, he grabs you out of that situation and he, re, and he restores you. And we move on to now Jonah is out of that fish's belly and something happens a second time in this book of Jonah. So let's read Jonah chapter 3 verse 1 to 3. Then the word of the Lord came to Jonah a second time. God gave Jonah the exact same message. Okay, you messed up. Now you are back. What do you do? <laughs> Saying, Arise, uh, uh, so go to Nineveh, that great city, and uh, so call out uh, against it the message that I tell you. But this time, Jonah responds differently. Jonah had a, a change of heart and a, a change of, of attitude. So Jonah rose and went to, to Nineveh, uh, according to the word of the Lord. Now Nineveh was an exceedingly great city. Three days journey in breath. The exceedingly great city now is being more emphasized. Imagine you had, you had to walk for three days and you are not at the end of the city. I would like to think it was bigger than Gauteng. Um, I did uh, so Google Maps how long it would uh, take to walk from uh, so Pretoria North to uh, the southest part of Joburg. That's a day's walk, so, but it might be smaller because there was a, it was more a uh, sedans to walk through it. So, uh, yeah, but just to have that picture of it was a big city. And now, so picture yourself as Jonah. You want a word from from God, and God gives a word, and and God. Uh, so, so keeps on giving you that same word, regardless if you mess up or whatever. God, when you want a word from God, God gives you exactly the same word, or God is silent. And then you ask yourself, God is not speaking to me, but ask yourself, what was the last thing that God said to you, and have you done it? God's not going to give you a new word until you've acted on the last one. So Jonah has not acted, well, he acted on the last word God gave, by running away and being uh, so disobedient, but God gives the same word. 
Now Jonah says, okay, now I need to act. I've uh, repented, God sent the fish. Now I need to go and preach this message that God has given. So if you find yourself in a situation where you keep on getting the same word or no word at all, ask yourself, what was the last thing that God has said to you? And ask yourself, have I done what God said? Have I done what God asks? It's up to us to do what God says. Anyway, verse uh, 40, uh, 5, Jonah be, uh, so, be, uh, so began to go into the city going uh, as a day's journey. And he called out, Yet forty days, and Nineveh shall be overthrown. And there's the people of Nineveh believed God. They, they called for a fast and has put on sackcloth from the greatest of them uh, to the least of them. Sackcloth, if I, if I can explain it the best way, is almost like a like a yarn type uh, some material, um, like an old bag where veggies and things would be put in. It's that, that harsh uh, some material. So they put that on to repent because being reminded of all the itches reminded you of your sin and it uh, uh, helps you to repent because you're just in this, uh, this uh, comfort the whole time. But... The situation in a crisis, or um, if we read uh, verse 6 uh, to 7, the word reached, uh, said the king of Nineveh, and he arose from his throne, removed his robe, uh, so covered himself with sackcloth, and sat in ashes, and he issued a proclamation, and as published through Nineveh, by the, uh, the decree of the king and his nobles, let neither man nor beast nor herd nor flock uh, taste anything, let them not feed or drink water. Just want to read verse 8 as well. Uh, so, but let man and beast be covered with sackcloth and let them call out mightily so to God. So imagine this word reaches Nineveh and they, they over respond and they over uh, that that message hits them so hard that the king goes and says even the, the cows must now fast <laughs> and I just see this uh, the cow in so the field with some guys walking up wrapping him in a sackcloth and <laughs> they repented so bad or not not bad but so so greatly that they even uh, even the animals had to uh, so fast and repent with them. And for some reason I had in my mind that they even clothed uh, so the trees with sackcloth. That's how, that's how earnestly they wanted to repent of their sin. When God speaks, we need to act, and we need to act in all seriousness. Uh, so, uh, so Nineveh was a heathen nation. They were, they were cruel. They, were drink, they, they hired soldiers that would go and kill people and drink their blood. That's Nineveh for you. They were bad, wicked, violent, violent people. They were not to be messed around with, but when they heard the word of God, they changed completely. So much so that even the Sadonki had to repent for something he was not even aware of is happening around him. But that's how earnestly they, they, they so repented. And uh, uh, so, the, uh, so the king wrote as well, Let everyone uh, so turn from his evil way and from the violence that is in his hands. Who knows, uh, so God may turn and relent and uh, so to turn from his fierce anger, so that we may not uh, so perish. When uh, so God saw what they did, how they turned from their evil way, God relented the disaster that he said he would uh, do to them, and he did not do it. In verse uh, 10, we read something very interesting about God. The King James Version said, And God repented. God does not repent. But the, the word being used there for re relented or repented is the Hebrew word nacham. Last week I shared about the uh, two Hebrew words and I said that this week we will go into nacham which is also uh, so translated as repent, but it's a different kind of uh, so, so repentance. Simply, it means uh, so to change one's mind. In some uh, so translations, you read that God changed his mind. 
God doesn't change, so why would his mind so change? So it, we need to ask a few things. It is in a, important for us uh, to look at this word Nacham because it is used in relation to God. And misunderstanding this so could very much affect our understanding of who God is. In the whole book of Jonah, we see that God does not change. He is he, he is who he is, and Jonah knows that God does not uh, change. Jonah knew that if he brings that word of repentance, Nineveh will repent because that is who God is. So now we read that God relented, God has, 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 has changed his mind. So we need to ask ourselves, what is it saying in a, the context of Jonah? If we think that man uh, can change God's mind, we are dangerously close uh, uh, to denying God of ultimate sovereignty. So what do we do? On the other hand, uh, to to suggest that God doesn't in any way respond to the cry of man, especially in relation to repentance, when man repents, God relents. It is to present a God who is distant or worse, even in a different. So if we hold a view that God cannot change his mind, how do we relate with God? We view him as that distant God all the way there. So what do we do with this? Because on the one hand, we uh, muddy our view of, of God. And, the, and on the other hand, we also muddy our view of a uh, God. So we need to treat this very biblically. So to explain, so in a, so God's plan of salvation, God wants to save all humanity. God responds as he planned so to do from the beginning of his uh, uh, time uh, to the repentant heart. God planned from the beginning. In Genesis 3 verse 15, when, when Adam and Eve sinned, God said, I will bring a savior. From the very beginning, God planned salvation. The whole idea was in a, 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 a choosing one nation is that that nation, Israel, can go out into the world and show the world and bring the world uh, so to God. But Israel failed on that part. But when Jesus came, he fulfilled that. And he said, go and make the disciples. God's plan is salvation from the beginning. So if God acts in salvation, he's not changing his mind. He's just being who he is. He, uh, so John 3 verse 16 says, For God so loved the world that he sent his only son. His love never changed. If someone cries out so to God, God will save them. God is not changing his mind on the wickedness that they have done. He is forgiving and loving. So he doesn't change, he's just being who he is. It is not to say that God, in moving through his uh, history, plans one thing, and then due to the actions of man, merely uh, agrees that man has uh, presented him with a better option and ends uh, changing his mind. Man does not give God a better option. God wants to save everyone. He sent Jonah to go save a uh, nation that was very wicked and cruel. Jonah did not want to go in the first place because he knew God will save them if they repent. Rather, we see a a God of, of, of 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 a compassion who from the beginning planned opportunities where he could express his emotion for his people. So God is not changing his mind. He's just doing what he wanted to do from the beginning, and that's save Nineveh. But it was up to them to respond and repent for God to do that. From, sorry, I said, uh, so, so, but, but God's plan uh, so could not be influenced by the will of man and his purpose was uh, accomplished. Jonah tried to influence God's will and God's plan and we saw that did not turn out great for him. So man uh, so cannot change God's will. Despite of man's will, God's will was done. Then we go into Jonah chapter 4, verse 1 to 3. And it's interesting when you read Jonah, Jonah chapter 1 is a longer chap- is a longish uh, chapter. Uh, chapter 2 is also a bit longer. But it seems that uh, chapter 3 and 4 is almost as long as uh, chapter 1. So Jonah writing this after he uh, walked back to... Um, I'm, I'm, I'm Israel writing this events down. It seems that 
the, when the focus was on him, he wrote at length. But when the focus moved from him, he just... Why does Jonah do that? It fits. He's a, a character in... Now he's writing this book to Israelites uh, so to remind them that we are called for the nations, not just for ourselves. He, he writes at length about himself and how he ran away and how uh, as God saved him. But when it comes to writing down how God saved someone else, that same grace that he received is now received by another nation. Then he just writes it short and uh, you will even see that the book ends without an ending and we ask ourselves, why is it this way? You can just uh, so picture Jonah being grumpy and poof, just writing it down, closing the book and sending it out. <laughs> Jonah had some uh, uh, some national pride that he did not want to write about the good that God has done for other nations. But he wants to write about the good that God has done for him. But Jonah being very angry, uh, Jonah 4 was 1, 2, 3, but he displeased Jonah exceedingly and he was angry. And he prayed uh, to the Lord and said, O Lord, is this not what I said when I was yet in my uh, 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 country, that is why I made haste so to flee uh, so to Tarsish, for I knew that you are a gracious God and merciful, slow to anger and uh, bounding in uh, steadfast love and relenting from a uh, disaster. Therefore, O oh, oh Lord, please take my life from me, for it is better for me so to die than to live. Jonah would rather die than to live in a world where God blessed his enemies. Jonah would rather die than to see his fellow nation succeed. Maybe sometimes we would rather die than to see God bless someone else. When we read the book of Jonah, it's we are holding up a mirror in front of ourselves and every emotion that we feel towards Jonah, we feel towards ourselves as well because it's such a challenging book. Even Jesus refers uh, uh, to Jonah as the great prophet. This disobedient, grumpy uh, prophet who says uh, uh, to God, rather kill me than I live in a world where you bless my enemies. Jesus refers to him as a great prophet. He says, uh, so the great prophet Jonah. But then interestingly, and uh, the Lord said, do you do well so to be angry? And Jonah doesn't even answer God. We can get caught up in religiosity so much that we forget it's a relationship. We can be real with God. You can tell God exactly how you feel because He already knows it. So you can just as well be real with God. If we cannot be real with the Creator of the universe, then what does it say for us? It's not a religion, it's a relationship. It's not a, a set of rules and regulations, and if, if you miss a rule, then something bad happens. It's a, it's a relationship. You can say to God, I am angry with you. He will still love you. He's unaffected by our emotion. We shared that yes, uh, today. Who is God if he can be influenced by human emotion? He doesn't get influenced by human emotion because he created us with emotion. <laughs> and then Jonah went out of the city and sat, uh, sat to the east of the city and made a booth for himself there. He, he sat under it in the shade uh, until he should see what would become of the city. So Jonah said, okay, he just preached a message saying, in 40 days, God will do this if you don't repent. So then he goes outside that city on the east wall, just think where the sun rises and sets sits on the east side of the wall, and now he's waiting. He wants to see what is God going to do with these people now. And God relents, obviously. So did he sleep there for 40 days? I don't know. Jonah doesn't tell us what he did. We just knew that he sat there waiting to see what's going to come of Nineveh now. He wanted to see now, is a God going to save this as people or not? God saved the people. Now the Lord God has appointed a plant and made it come up over Jonah that it might be a shade over his head to save him from his discomfort. 
even in this brooding, he's brooding, he's angry. He's, he's not even answering God when God speaks. He's just sitting there waiting and God brings him comfort. God is just so good. God is just so good. So Jonah was exceedingly glad because of the plant. He's there, his world is so small because now this plant comes up and now he's, ah, oh, this plant, ah, oh, God is good. He's bringing me a plant for my comfort. But when a, 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 the dawn came up the next day, God uh, appointed a worm that uh, attacked the plant so that it withered. When the sun rose, uh, God uh, appointed a scorching east wind and, and the sun beat down on the head of Jonah so that he was faint. And he asked that he might die and said, It is better for me to die than to live. Uh, uh, so but God Said to Jonah, do you do well to be angry for the plant? And Jonah replies and says, yes, I do well uh, to be angry. Angry enough to die. (laughs) You have to see the irony in here. Jonah is a man (laughs) with a death wish. He wants to die when it goes good. He wants to die when it goes bad. He just wants to, he doesn't want to live in a world where God blesses his enemies. He would rather die. This is the third and the fourth uh, uh, time in the, the, the book that he basically is asking to, to die. Now Jonah is angry that God killed the shade plant. He is angry with uh, God first because he spared the lives of the Ninevites, Israel's enemy, or a brooding enemy for Israel, who he thought uh, deserved death. And now he killed the plant that he thought should live. So, so God saves who Jonah thinks should die, and kills what Jonah thinks should live. God is exposing Jonah's heart there solidly. Sometimes God exposes our hearts and our inner attentions, and maybe we feel angry. It's okay. The the Bible doesn't say don't be angry. It says be angry and do not sin. So (laughs) here, uh, so God is saving who Jonah thinks should live and kills what Jonah thinks should live. Jonah is more so concerned for the life of the plant than for the life of all those so people that are in danger of being judged by God. Jonah doesn't feel a thing for the 120,000 people that he just uh, so preached to, but he cares for this little bit of a, as a comfort. Jonah's world is so small Jonah's interest in so the plant was completely selfish. Jonah wanted the so plant for his own uh, so comfort and enjoyment. And, and this is where the book ends. Abruptly, without a conclusion. It doesn't tell us what happened afterwards. We can read the so prophet Nahum for the second warning to Nineveh. And Nineveh fell in 610 BC, which is about... 100 to uh, 200 years after Jonah went to preach to Nineveh. But, and the Lord said, You pity the plant for which you did not labor, nor uh, did you make it grow, which has came into being in a night and, and, uh, and perished in a night. And should not I pity Nineveh, that great city in which there are more than 120,000 people, uh, persons who do not know their, their right hand from their left and so much cattle? The end. <laughs> Even writing this, you can pick up on, on a, a Jonah. He just wants to get to the end, close the book, send it out. He doesn't want to elaborate on God and how he saved the other nations. He doesn't. That's where it ends. For years I've asked myself, why does it end just like that? The more I read Jonah, the more it's obvious that Jonah is still, even in writing this, after he sees everything, he still (laughs) doesn't want to write about the God that blessed his enemies. But God was exposing a, a, a contrast in a, 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 a Jonah. <laughs> he was exposing Jonah's lack of spiritual concern for Nineveh. Uh, so compared to his selfish physical concern over the vine, he was more concerned over a plant than people. Israel was called to be a nation, a light for the world, but they failed in that so bad. 
And God brought prophet after prophet to remind them. But we will, we will get to that now. Jonah played, oh, uh, uh, so Jonah found his own as a comfort more in his port than the salvation of more than 120,000 people. Jonah played no support in making the vine grow, but he still grieved over it. God, on the other, other hand, had made the, the Ninevites and was concerned for their lives and there is uh, eternity. God created all humans. Every living thing God created, and He cares for every living thing. Even in the Old Testament, God cared for the other nations. Jonah is a Jonah is such a, a picture of what Israel was like in his day. They didn't want to be a blessing to the other nations. They didn't want to open the the doors for the other nations because we are God's people, and it's only us that are uh, uh, to God's people. No one should be blessed by God other than us. It can only go well with me, myself, and I. And sometimes we find ourselves in that attitude. God's heart was always that they be a witness to all nations. When you read the uh, books of the law, you find laws in place for Israel to invite other nations in to Israel. It's been always God's plan for all people to be saved. In sending Jesus, all people to be saved. God wanted Israel to be the first empire and to spread the word of the Lord and His law to all nations. It was in the law, it was in the commands. This is why He gave Israel the land that He did. This is why He in a, trusted them with the law. And this is why He judged them for failing, for falling away from Him. Israel was not a witness uh, to the nations. They were not set uh, as a part. In fact, they so compromised and uh, so became just like all the other nations. That's why God sent them into exile. God brought judgment because they were not being who He called them to be. In a st instead of bringing God and the law to other nations, they let the other nations bring their law and their rituals and their gods, the gods in. I'm playing on this because I'm getting somewhere with this. Because it's exposing our hearts. When you read the Old uh, uh, Testament and you ask yourself, how can Israel stop there one second and think, how can I? And then, and then we say, Jesus, I need grace. Come and deal with my heart because it's not, it's not a pure heart. Uh, so create in me a, a, a pure heart and as, so teach me. Teach me to love like you do. Because there's something flawed in us. We are not sinners because we sin. We sin because we are sinners. We are fallen. We need Jesus. We need grace. So the moment we find ourselves asking, how can this nation turn their back on God? Just reflect on your own life a little bit. God chose Israel not because they were special anymore than any other people or, or nation, but because he is a kid for all nations and wanted them to be uh, to reach the world. When when God gave the uh, promise to Abraham, what was that 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 promise? That all nations be blessed. I will make you your your offspring a multitude, so that other nations can be blessed. It was not so that you can be blessed. It was always evangelical. It was always missionary. It was always go into the world and make disciples of all nations. That's not a new a command for a disciple who, is, who grew up Jewish. It's inherent. They had to go and spread the word of God, but they did not. They were uh, uh, caught up in, in their own interest, in their own legalism and all of that, that they failed to obey what God said in the first place. How, how, however, Israel failed miserably at God's uh, six command for them. Israel uh, so could barely get it right themselves, let alone be a witness to others. With very few expectations, or uh, with very few exceptions, Israel never brought uh, the truth to their surrounding nations. 
However, with uh, uh, Sojona and, and Nahum, we see a rare uh, picture of someone from Israel reaching out to a neighboring nation like God originally in us attended. Jesus came and said, I am the, the, the light of the world. Uh, Jesus came to seek and save the lost. And he sent us so to go and make disciples of all nations. It has always been God's heart to spread the word. It has always been God's heart to save the lost people. And you and I have a role in that. Everyone's role might look differently, but we all have a role in that. And that's where I get to the conclusion of Jonah. The first sermon was the ultimate uh, calling. And the ultimate calling is to be obedient to what God has called you to do. That is why we are here. That is our purpose. And the hope with this whole series of Jonah is to, is to create a fire under you to say, God, let's go. What am I called here to do and what can I do to uh, achieve it? I once again forgot the uh, prospectus because if you feel called, get is equipped. Go get an, 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 an education in the area that God has called you so that we can do that with excellence. When it comes to oh, obeying the uh, call of God, being oh, obedient in that prophetic word that God gave, we must ask ourselves, whose attitude will we embrace, Jonah's or so God's? Will we embrace Jonah's and run away, or will we embrace God and be faithful and be oh, obedient to what God called us? Are we willing to do what God has uh, called us to do, or will we shy and not focus on what God called us uh, to be. Maybe we need to go back and go ask ourselves, okay, what is the last word that God gave me? Am I getting that same word the whole time? Maybe I need to be oh, obedient to what God called me to be, or to do. Jonah failed uh, to see that, is not, that it is not about him. He focused so much on himself that he failed to see that God's plan for him is not about him. It's about the other nations. And maybe God's plan for my life is not about me, but about what God wants to do. With uh, so, uh, so, uh, so the plant, God exposed Jonah's heart that he uh, cared more for the plant than God's people. It is not uh, about us, but about what God wants us to do. The, the ultimate calling is to be obedient to, to what God called us to do. Go and see God's will for your life. Ask Him, God, what is your plan for my life? What is the last word that you gave me? Maybe you haven't received that word over your life. Then come, let's ask uh, to God for that word that you can know what, where God wants you to move to. And just be open uh, uh, to what God calls you, you to do and uh, take action on the, 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 the word that God has given you. Like the, the Ninevites who over-responded when God speak, let us have that attitude to over-respond to the call that God has on our lives. Because at the end of the day, that's what it's about. You will find so much peace and freedom in your heart if you, if you, if you view life as Jesus in the center of it all. You make every decision based on Jesus. What are you saying? What is, what do we need to do here? If Jesus is the center of your life and it envelops every thought and every, every prayer that you don't even do anything without, without asking God, is this in line with what you called me for? That brings so much peace and so much calm in your heart. I cannot even begin to explain how while I sleep, since I started to move in the will of God for my life, not caring about anything because I know God is faithful. God is uh, uh, so true. It is not about me and my bank balance. It's about God and what He said. It's not about me and the friendships and the, and the, the people around me because I'm not uh, accountable to them. I'm uh, accountable to God and what He will say. And when I, when I go to be with him, I hope to hear these words. Well done, good and faithful servant. There's something that I want to share. 
there's this guy who uh, uh, Sir died and went to heaven. He was a uh, janitor somewhere. And Jesus said to him, Oh, Lucas, the uh, a doctor, welcome, welcome. He said, No, 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 no. I'm a janitor. Jesus said, No, no, you are Lucas, the doctor. And he said, No, no, Jesus, sorry. I think you must think of someone else. I'm just a uh, janitor. Jesus said, No. You were called to be a doctor, but you chose to be a janitor. Let's see God's will for our lives. It's never too late. Jonah at the bottom of the ocean, in all logic and all physics and all science, it was too late for him. But God made a way and God will make a way for you. In the area of a calling, we can sometimes be insecure or or overthink some things but if god called you to do something he will provide if it's his will he will provide let us pray father thank you for this message of of a, a jonah as we go through it and as we read through a uh, so jonah uh, so god our 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 own hearts and our own her desires are so exposed in front of you. Thank you for sending your son Jesus so to die for us on onto the cross so that we can have forgiveness, that we know that you don't relent. You want, you want salvation uh, to come uh, 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 to the lost. And as we all have a role so to play in that, Father, I uh, uh, pray that you will reveal the callings that you will confirm her callings, that you will plant a seed that we know, that we know, that you know, that this is what God has called me to do. Holy Spirit, I pray that you in, in a power each and every one here this morning. Reignite a fire in their hearts. Reignite a fire in their hearts. Bring the revival, bring revival into the area of a, a calling. That may we, may we put aside our own selves and our own selfishness. That we can follow you and experience a loving relationship with you. In the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. If you need a, a prayer or a word from God, you can come. Otherwise, let's get uh, a coffee. The uh, uh, the drinks are probably hot by now, (laughs) but you're more than welcome.